Dear brothers and sisters, welcome and thank you for joining us even as we grab this wonderful opportunity of studying the Word of God together. In our previous study, we saw the healing of the man who had suffered from infirmity for 38 long years. The pool of Bethesda could not help because there was nobody to put him in when an angel stirred it. Jesus healed the man and forgave his sins. But because it was on Sabbath that the man carried his bed, the Jews were all out trying to kill Jesus. We then look at the three claims of Jesus. First, that he himself is God because he does only what the Father does. Second, as the Father raises the dead, so does the Son. The third, the Father committed all judgment unto the Son. He then continues to add that those who honor the Son equally honor the Father. Therefore, those who hear it and believe it, the Son, have everlasting life. Today, we shall look at more of Jesus' teachings. And I pray that you would be blessed as we dig John further. Please turn to John chapter 5 and let's continue in our study here in the book of John. Let's read verses 26 to 27 of John chapter 5. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. The Lord Jesus is a life giver. Isn't that wonderful? Not only does he have life, but he offers life to us. He also has the right to execute judgment. He came the first time as the Savior and not to judge, but He is coming the next time as the judge. At that time, those in the graves will hear His voice. Verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear His voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. A better translation for the word damnation would be judgment. There are two resurrections mentioned here. The book of Revelation is even more specific and describes the completion of the first resurrection. You will find this in Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 to 6. Then the second resurrection, it is chapter 20 of Revelation verses 11 to 15. The first resurrection is a resurrection of all the saved the first phase of which is the next thing on the agenda of God. We call it the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Paul uses it and it says, We shall be caught up, which means to be raptured. The rapture takes place at some time in the future. It is not dated and there are no signs given for it. It could happen at any given moment. He is going to call his own out of this world, both the living and the dead. This is part of the first resurrection. Then, during the tribulation period, a great many believers will become martyrs. I hope you're listening. They will be raised at the end of the great tribulation period together with the Old Testament saints. That also is part of the first resurrection. They will be raised to live forever here upon this earth. That is the first resurrection. It is the resurrection of life, as our Lord called it. Then, the resurrection of judgment is the great white throne judgment when all those who are unsaved of all the ages will be raised. They wanted to be judged by their works, and they will be. They will stand before God who is just and righteous. They will have an opportunity to stand before a holy God and plead their case. But God has already won them. There is no one saved in that judgment. It is only the lost who are brought there and they will be judged according to their works because there are degrees in punishment. Luke 12, 47 to 48. Now let's move on to verse 30 of John 5. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Jesus says, I can of mine own self do nothing. Now that is his self-limitation. 
when he came down to this earth and took upon himself our humanity. He came down as a man, not to do his own will, but the Father's will. This is the example for us today. You and I have a will, an old nature, that is not obedient to God. We can't be obedient to God because we are actually in rebellion against God. That is the natural state of every man. That is the reason our Lord had to tell Nicodemus that he must be born again. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. John 3, 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. John 3, 6. You and I have to have the new birth because this old nature is incorrigible. It is in rebellion against God. It has been carrying a protest banner before the gates of heaven ever since man came out through the gates of paradise in the Garden of Eden. Now, our Lord is going to show that there are witnesses to the fact that His claims are true. Verse 31, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. The scripture teaches that the mouth of two or three witnesses is a thing established. Yes, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a thing is established. I bear witness of myself. That would not stand up in court. But there is another that beareth witness of me. The witness he is referring to here is not John the Baptist. They would immediately think that is the one to whom he is referring. But he makes it clear that he is not referring to a human witness at all. Verse 33 says, He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. Now he is saying that John the Baptist did bear witness to him. So that is one witness whom they knew. But he is referring to still yet another witness, not a human witness. And that makes two witnesses for them to recognize. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. John 5.34 He claims a higher witness than the witness of a man. Yet he does give a witness or a testimony to John the Baptist. Now in the King James Version, he calls John a light. Now a more accurate translation is a lamp. You see, Jesus is the light. John was his witness, his light bearer, his lamp, if you please. He was a burning and a shining light and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. This is verses 35 to 36. I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. Now here we see that the credentials that the Lord Jesus had were the miracles that he performed. The idea today that there are those who have the same power that Jesus had is, to my judgment, blasphemy. You see, these miracles which he performed attested that he was who he claimed to be. And friend, there weren't just a few isolated instances of healing. He didn't put on healing services. He took no offering. He didn't have people get in a line to come to him. You know what Jesus did? He moved out into the crowds, into the highways and the byways. And as he moved along, people were healed. I've called attention to this in the Gospels again and again. And it is important to refresh our memories concerning this. Friend, there were not just half a dozen or even a hundred or two whom he had healed. There were literally thousands of people whom he had healed. It was openly demonstrated. Nobody in that day contradicted the fact that he had healed people. He would have been a fool if he had. It is over 2,000 years. And later in a musty library, thousands of miles removed, scholars, you know, can sit down and write books declaring that they don't believe Jesus performed miracles. You know, it sounds very ridiculous. But that doesn't prove a thing, friend. His miracles were his credentials. His works bore witness that the Father had sent him. 
Now let's move on. John 5, 37 to 39. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, whom ye believe not. Such the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now the last verse is so frequently misunderstood. It is not an imperative, but it is an indicative. Let me put it like this. You search the scriptures. Now he's making a statement. He's not urging them to do anything, but he tells them that they search the scriptures thinking that in them they will find eternal life. But they don't understand that the scriptures are actually testifying of Christ. Friend, you had better be careful so that you would find, so that you find Jesus in the Bible. If you don't, then your search is in vain. Verse 40. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. The scriptures speak of him, but the religious rulers are unwilling to come to him. They refuse to do that, and they are missing the point. But I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. This is verses 42 and now verse 43. I am come in my Father's name, and he receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him he will receive. You know, someday the Antichrist is coming, and the world, of course, is going to receive him. They rejected Christ. The Antichrist will come in his own name, will have an image made of himself, and what are they going to do? They will accept him. Verse 44, How can ye believe which receive honor one of another? And seek not the honor that cometh from God only. You know, they looked for the applause of men. Back scratching is still the curse today in many of our fellowships, even our good fellowships. There are teachers with itching ears. Each one wants to compliment the other rather than tell the truth of the word of God. They seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Verses 45 to 47. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses in whom ye trust. For had he believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if he believed not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Friend, that's so important. Back in the books of the Pentateuch, which I have recently taught, I have attempted to point out the Lord Jesus. Although I don't find him on every page, I believe he is on every page of the Pentateuch. He says, Moses wrote of me. I think he is on every page of the Bible. When a man begins to make an attack upon the Old Testament, watch out. He is really making a subtle attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. I am afraid there are many men who very foolishly begin to question the Old Testament and don't realize what they are doing. It is like the man at the insane asylum who was digging at the foundation. A man came by and asked him, Why are you trying to dig out the foundation? Don't you live in the building? Yes, he answered, but I live upstairs. <laughs> I am afraid that a great many foolish people say, But I live in the New Testament. My friend, the Old Testament is the foundation. Our Lord said, if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? They both go together. Well, dear friend, we've completed chapter 5 and now we're just moving on to chapter 6. The theme here is Jesus feeding the 5,000 near the Sea of Galilee. This is the fourth work and the word. We come now to the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. A miracle recorded in all four Gospels. In the Gospel of John, Jesus follows this miracle with a discourse on the bread of life. John records only certain miracles and he calls the miracles signs because signs are for a purpose. You will remember that he said, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. 
This is John 20 verses 30 to 31. It says, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. This is an important verse because it actually, it is actually the key to this entire gospel. Now we find Jesus feeding the 5,000 and out of this grows his great discourse on the fact that he is the true bread of God. Now Jesus feeds the 5,000. This is the fourth work and word. Let's turn to John chapter 6 and let's read verse 1 right now. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. After what things? Well, the things that were recorded back in the fifth chapter. He had left Jerusalem and had probably come up on the east side of the Jordan River. Now he crosses over the Sea of Galilee and apparently comes to the north section. This took place about six months to a year after the events of chapter 5. It was about one year before his crucifixion, by the way. The way the events are dated is by the feast that John mentions. As we have said, John ties his gospel down to a calendar and to a map. The one who came out of heaven's glory, the word who was made flesh, the one who pitched his tent here among us, that one walked by the Sea of Galilee. He went to Cana, to Nazareth, Capernaum. Bethsaida, Jerusalem, Decapolis, etc. So we read that after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee. John says, And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. This is verse 4. So apparently he had been back in the land of Galilee because in chapter 5 he had been in Jerusalem and had gone in the Sheep Gate. This indicates a time lapse between chapters 5 and 6 when he went over the Sea of Galilee. Now let's read verse 2. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. The tense of the verb would be more accurate if it were translated and a great multitude was following him and because they were seeing his miracles. The great multitude didn't actually believe in him in a saving way. They didn't trust him. They were basically interested in his miracles. They wanted him because he could make them well. Friend, the mission of Jesus was definitely not to merely restore our physical bodies. He wants to be Lord of our hearts. That is why John had said at the very beginning, that he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. John 2.25 He didn't commit himself to that crowd back here or back there at Jerusalem, and he's certainly not about to commit himself to this crowd that is gathering around. They simply want to see the miracles that he can perform. Verse 3 And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. This is verse 3 of John chapter 6. The place that is pointed out to tourists visiting Israel is not what we would call a mountain. Actually, in that land, 3,000 feet is about as high as they go. But the hills are very rugged. The one they point out is a very lovely spot and could well be the place where he fed the 5,000. It's near Capernaum. Jesus went up into the mountain and sat there with his disciples. The Passover is near. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes, this is verse 5, and saw a great company come unto him, he had said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? <laughs> Philip was a quiet one. He never had much to say. Our Lord was drawing him out at this particular time. You will find in verse 8 that Philip and Andrew seem to have gotten together. Andrew and Philip evidently were quite active men, very busy but just not speakers. You don't hear either one of them. Yet Andrew is the one who brought Simon Peter to the Lord. 
and the Greeks came to Philip and Andrew when they wanted to see Jesus. Philip got together with Andrew to find out what to do. So we find them together here. Is our Lord asking for advice in his question to Philip? May I say to you, he never asked for advice. And then why did he ask Philip the question? John 6.6 6 says, And this he said to prove for himself what he would do. He was basically testing Philip. Philip looked over that crowd that was coming, 5,000 men besides women and children. It could be at least 15,000 people who were congregated by that hill. Friend, that's a pretty large-sized crowd, especially for that land and in that day. When Philip saw them coming, this host of 15,000 people at least, he was definitely not thinking of a miracle at all. Philip answered him in verse 7, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. Why did Philip light upon that fixed sum of 200 denarii? I think that is what they had in the treasury at that time. Probably Judas had made a treasurer's report that morning and that was the sum total. Philip looked at the crowd, then thought of what they had in the treasury bag and said that 200 penny worth of bread would not be sufficient for them. The penny was the Roman coin denarius. One denarius represented a day's wages for a common laborer. The other gospel writers tell us that the disciples advised the Lord Jesus. They wanted to be on the board of directors. They said, why don't you send the multitude away? Our Lord answered, we're not going to send them away. We're going to have them sit down and we're going to feed them. Luke 9, 12 to 15. These men who had elected themselves to the board of directors found themselves waiters serving the crowd. And that is what they should have been doing all the time. By the way, this leads me to say that there are too many men in our fellowships today who want position. They want to have an office. They want to be on the board of directors. They like to tell the preacher what to do. Yet, they do not have all the necessary information to begin with, nor do they have the spiritual discernment. They don't realize that they are the ones who ought to be out doing the work of the ministry. They ought to be out sharing their faith, passing the bread to the hungry multitudes. But generally, they would rather advise the one who is leading on how to do it. So here our Lord is drawing out Philip and Philip says they don't have enough money to buy sufficient bread. Well, it's too bad, dear friend. We've got to bring the study to a close at this interesting place. God bless. Dear friends, there were several areas of discussion today, but I would wish to recall just one before we wind up our study. We saw that God has ordained Jesus with the authorities of both life and judgment, now and in the age to come. He came as a Savior with love and grace in His first appearing, but will come as King and Judge when He returns again. But the beauty in all our study was in the fact that Jesus was in continual submission to God the Father. He proclaimed that He was from the Father, doing the will of the Father, and seeking the honor that cometh only from the Father alone. If every child of God lives in that rhythm, what paradise it would be here on this earth. Let us pray that God would help us become more like Jesus day by day. Till we meet again, may God keep you always. Mm -hmm.